I'm, others who want to put questions, please put your hands up uh, so the people can bring the microphone to you so we can, don't have to wait for it. Please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Andrik Ladi, and I'm from Ukraine, and I currently work in Iceland. Uh, Mr. Admiral, thank you for your uh, speech. And in your recent speech, you had mentioned that uh, Ukraine had transformed the modern warfare. And this is an undeniable fact. Uh, so therefore, my question is, what did NATO learn following this war? And what NATO, what instruments could be implemented to prevent or to oppose uh, I would say hypothetical um, private military campaigns activities in the Arctic. We also can deny this uh, uh, fact, for instance. And uh, I would just would like to comment. No, that, no, uh, you, no, no. This is for questions. We, we yes. let him answer, please. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. How long do we have? Um, yeah, so I think um, in terms of uh, the war in Ukraine, some lessons are also lessons for NATO. Uh, one of the big differences between a, a war where NATO is involved and a war where Ukraine is involved, that NATO has a much stronger air force. So some of the things that Ukraine has to do now, uh, in, the, in the particular way in the counteroffensive, is understandable given the fact that you do not have uh, a very uh, a strong uh, air force against the Russians. So um, that makes actually the progress in the counteroffensive so much more impressive because uh, the Ukrainian armed forces basically crawled forward in minefields that are 10 kilometers deep and that are having five to six mines per square meter. And that's how they would then reach the first physical barrier that was put up by the Russians, and then after that there's another terrain, and then there's a second physical barrier. So Ukraine is moving forward still every day. Sometimes it's 100 meters, sometimes it's a kilometer. They move forward every day. And that means that the Russians lose ground every day. And it's not as fast as the Ukrainians want it to go, but it's the reality of how they have to fight this war. Uh, second, um, when it comes to uh, other lessons, I think one of the lessons is um, the, the use of drones. I think that is one of the lessons that is going to affect probably all the conflicts that we will see in the future. We saw it in, in, uh, in uh, when Hamas attacked uh, <coughs> Israel uh, and how Israel operates in Gaza. Drones are there to stay, uh, and it means basically that it becomes more and more difficult to hide. I think that's the big change. So it becomes more and more difficult to hide, and therefore uh, forces on the ground need to move, to be constantly on the move. A division, which is about 20,000 people, and their headquarters need to move every three to four days. So that is the, the, the new reality. And then your last question with regard to the private military uh, campaign uh, companies, uh, it, th that is a challenge. I, I don't have a, a ready answer for it. It's probably, uh, it has to do with what the nations can agree amongst them in the Arctic Council, I would, I would assume, uh, to prevent that from happening. Can I take you back to the Arctic analysis in your speech, because you rightly described the growing uh, relationship between Russia and China <coughs> in terms of energy, the building of the 8,000 kilometers long pipeline from the Siberian part of Russia all the way down to Shanghai, uh, the plans for a second pipeline, uh, maybe India is also interested in a gas pipeline to India because these uh, large nations need needs enemy, uh, need, needs a lot of energy. So am I correct in understanding you in the way that since these energy mining uh, interests uh, between Russia and China, definitely maybe Russia and some other Asian countries as well, 
will continue. And as you said, because of the Russian military position in the Arctic and the, uh, the non-transparency of the Chinese interest, is it correct to conclude from the analysis you were drawing that there will, in your opinion, be a continuous need in the coming years for a defense or military buildup from NATO, the western side, up, up in the Arctic? Um, it's not only because of these uh, uh, energy deals, it is also because of the Russian behavior. I mean, uh, the reason why uh, NATO's posture against Russia changed was because of the Russian behavior. In 2008, they invaded Georgia. In 2014, they annexed Crimea. In 2022, they invaded the rest of Ukraine. That is their behavior, nobody else's. And as a result, NATO has changed its policy with regard to Russia. We tried to work with Russia for 20 years as a partner. We were not interesting, interested in having an aggressive relationship with Russia. It was Russia that chose to move in another direction. And their behavior has led to our changed posture and now our refocus on collective defense. The nations in the Arctic are worried. We're talking about seven out of the eight nations of the Arctic Council that are a member of NATO if Sweden has joined the alliance and they are concerned of what happens there. It's the buildup of the Russian infrastructure, military infrastructure, and of course, then uh, on top of that, I talked about the increasing relationship, the strategic relationship between China and Russia. And it is unclear, that's what I said, what the consequences of that for the alliances, for the alliances in the high north. Mm. That's what I said. Okay, I thought there was a question there in the back. Was, did I see that correctly or not? Yes, the one the, here, here in the middle. Yeah. Oh, there's a gentleman there in the back. Yes, there in the back, and then there's a question here, here in the middle of the hall. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Um, hi, my name is Gabriel Gaden, and I'm a student in the University of Iceland in political science. So my question is also concerning the war in Ukraine and what's happening right now. Uh, considering the constant evolution of uh, war techniques and war means, um, to you, Admiral, uh, what should be the focus of Western allies and NATO considering hybrid threats and the new uh, means and ways of war um, that's happening in the Ukrainian war today? Thank you. Can we take also the question here in the middle? Yes, please, bring, bring the microphone there. Is that Yes, fine. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bailey Wong. I'm with the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy in the United States. And my question to you, Admiral, is as you mentioned, China's intentions are unclear or uncertain, and the change in policy of NATO it, towards Russia is based on aggressive behavior, which is observable. Um, and so my question is with regards to China and NATO. In this uncertainty and maybe lack of specific behavior which can be pointed to, is there not room for collaboration or cooperation um, within this uncertain framework? Thank you. Um, yeah, let me start with the last one because it is important. Uh, NATO describes China as a challenge, not a threat. Uh, and therefore, we are concerned, but there is dialogue. I meet every year in uh, Singapore. I meet with a Chinese delegation during the Shangri-La Dialogue, and we exchange our concerns with regard to uh, what is happening between China and, and NATO. And I think that is extremely important to, to talk to one another. So there is dialogue, also on the political level, uh, but as a result <coughs> of the war in Ukraine, the political dialogue with Russia died down. Then it was, uh, there were two people in NATO on the military side allowed to talk to the Russian chief of defense, General Gerasimov, which is the CMC, that's me, 
and the Supreme Allied Commander Europe. I've reached out to Gr General Gerasimov now four times, and he doesn't want to talk to me. In the beginning, he said uh, he was busy with this special operation, and he would soon come back to me. We're now in the 20th month of a three-day war. And so then the third letter was on uh, that he said, NATO is part of the problem, and therefore I, I, I won't talk to you. And now the last letter, after the drones that land in Romania, as a result of the attacks on the other side of the Danube River in Ukraine, some of these drones drift away and end up in NATO territory. And we want to find out whether that is intentional or not. That's why this mill-to-mill -mill contact is so important, to basically find out, is this, a, is this your intention to do this or is it an accident? And if you can find out that it is an accident, then you have a different discussions than it, when it is intentional. So, I mean, that's the reason why we should have that discussion. Now, I'm not having that discussion with the Chinese. That's not about this type of threat or uh, military interventions. That's not the case. It is on, uh, on the intentions of China. It is on how they see NATO, how we see China. And I, 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 won't, uh, I, I would lie if there's not disagreement on certain issues. Uh, one of the topics is why is NATO interested in Southeast Asia, for example? Uh, I would say the same way China is interested in Europe. Chinese frigates came to Baltic Sea in 2017 to participate in the Russian exercise Zapat. Uh, they passed through the English Channel. They passed through internationally recognized, uh, recognized international waters. So they were not stopped, blocked, harassed in, in any way. But if NATO allies sail through the Taiwan Strait, for example, they are sometimes being harassed. So there is a difference in, in approach and how we deal with each other. It's not a NATO-China issue, per se, but it is amongst some of the allies. There is, uh, there is uh, sometimes a, a difference of opinion on how the rules-based in, uh, international order is to be interpreted. And last year, one of my questions back to the ambassador was also, uh, who, I, who, who, who talked to me first and, uh, in response to my speech, was about this, is how, how do we interpret the rules-based international order? And I think that is one of the questions that is on the table for the coming years, because I think uh, in some ways uh, the present set of rules is not to the liking of a number of nations, and that in itself is not a problem if you want to change the rules in accordance with the rules. But if you do it by force, if you do it by might and not through discussions, that's something we shouldn't do. And I think that is, uh, that is part of the discussion. So NATO is not looking at China as a threat. There is dialogue. And I think that is important to continue having that. To the gentleman, uh, Gabriel, in the back, uh, hybrid warfare. Um, for many years, people thought that the new war would be about cyber and drones and artificial intelligence and quantum and sort of a clean war. That's what people thought. And I think actually people hoped that was the way war was going to evolve. For a very long time, a lot of people in politics thought about the world as they wanted it to look like, not necessarily as it looked like. And so, I think in terms of how the war is fought in Ukraine, we see on the one hand first and second world war tactics. The trenches are back, uh, artillery barrages, 20 to 30,000 artillery rounds per day from the Russians on Ukraine. That's more than seven million rounds per year. That is what is happening. That is Second World War, First World War. Yes, there is cyber, but cyber has not been decisive. Cyber has not been changing the course of the war. 
And therefore, we have to be ready for this old war and at the same time be ready for the new war with drones and artificial intelligence, which makes uh, them much more accurate, which makes them much more effective. And, uh, and that is all happening at the same time. And that makes it so difficult to choose. In most of our nations, uh, politicians, uh, and also the industry has focused on efficiency for the last 30 years. Just in time, just enough in the industry. Governments spent as little as possible on anything. And so therefore it is always on efficiency, not on effectiveness. And if the enemy has a tank, it's probably handy to have a tank as well. So if you choose, you can make the, the, the wrong choice. Because if you are attacked, that's what we are focusing on again, collected offense. Somebody can attack us. And therefore, we have to be readier than in the past. We have to be ready to counter that if it comes. Well, thank you very much, Hartman, uh, for uh, presenting these views so comprehensively and clearly and and answering the questions in this way. Uh, I hope you also see from not only the uh, packed hall we have here, but also the interest we sense from the audience, that it's a very important part of moving forward to have the opportunity to have this uh, open, uh, open dialogue, where, uh, as you know, I didn't have any idea who would ask the questions or, or what they would ask you about. And as a part of the mission uh, of the Alliance, uh, such an open uh, di dialogue and discussion with uh, the representatives of the Arctic communities and those interested in the Arctic in this platform is important for us, then I mean the people in the Arctic, not the Arctic Circle, but I hope the Alliance also finds it important, and I take that from your efforts of being here again. I'm not, like I did last year, putting you under pressure to return next year as well. I think that would perhaps be too much to ask, although you are always welcome. If you promise the weather is better. Yeah, typical <laughs> weather. Yes, uh, well, this is the first time the weather has had some disturbing effect on the Arctic Circle. Climate change, there you go. Yes, yes we, we discussed that during the first day. But this is also the session where we have uh, overrun our time more than any other session uh, du during the assembly. We I'm see honored. that here on I'm the screen. I'm not blaming you, but just for the audience. But thank you again very much for coming and being willing to engage in this dialogue and present your view so clearly and systematically as you have. Uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of follow-up discussions and thinking uh, from the audience. And we will, as an organization, try to facilitate that dialogue as we, as we move forward. So thank you very much. And, and uh, we will, of course, be able to welcome your questions.